Hey guys, it's me, Naomi. I'm here to do the Q&A that I promised you. Hopefully you are uh, around, listening, paying attention if, there, if you submitted a question, but if not, I will send out a recording of this afterward. Um, so, sorry I'm a few minutes late. I have to admit I am over-caffeinated this morning. Um, so I'm gonna try to hold it together for you and answer these questions. Um, okay, so. I have some questions that were submitted by email and posted in the group, uh, and I'm going to run through those now. So Maria wanted to know, um, she says she's finding it a bit difficult to plot for an idea involving three main characters. They each have their own goal and antagonist and general story arc, but the stories will be intertwined. Uh, most guides or articles are very much based on the typical story of a single protagonist with a clear physical goal and a very clear antagonist, so it's difficult to um, plot this story that has three main characters. And she's wondering if she's uh, if her efforts to make them all the protagonist is getting in the way and if it would be better to choose one to focus on and make the other subplots. Uh, and I think that's a good question. A lot of people have asked this same question, I think, um, about how to sort of do multi protagonist stories, um, ensemble stories maybe, or just uh, a story with several, you know, important plot lines uh, that are all sort of intertwined. Um, and I think, you know, just off the top of my head, I think that there are probably a few ways that you can do this, and they probably all involve finding what it is in your story that unites those three storylines, right? Um, and I think that what unites them probably has to do with um, either the character relationships, the, uh, you know, the, um, the goal that each character is pursuing in their individual storyline, um, and or the theme stuff that you're exploring, right? So I think any combination of those three things, the more you can like find those connections and find the, um, the sort of unity or the, the unifying things among those three areas, uh, the more your story will feel cohesive, even though you have three storylines going on. Um, so for, for some examples, I think um, one of the movies that I have used recently is Game Night. If, I don't know if you've seen that one. But uh, that's more of a situation where they have a main protagonist, but then also a few subplots that get a lot of weight as well. Um, so it's it feels like an ensemble, even though there's really, you know, kind of one main protagonist. Um, and the way they made that one work is, um, you know, all of the characters are sort of trying to achieve the same goal, ultimately. They're all working to save the guy's brother, right, from the kidnappers. So, so that's a, an example of finding unity in the goal. They're all pursuing the same thing. And then each of them is also dealing with individual relationship problems, which connects with the theme and, um, and you know, connects with the, uh, the idea of like finding unity in your character relationships, right? So each of their relationships with other characters um, is, is an issue, it has an issue at the center of it that they're dealing with that, that is a thematic issue, right? So there's unity there. Um, and really the idea is, is finding the way to you know, plot your storyline so that your, your movie feels cohesive. It doesn't feel like you have three random stories that don't have anything to, to do with each other, um, which still might work. I think you can do anything, but, uh, but I think um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to feel more intentional if you find that unity among those storylines. Um, so a couple of other examples, uh, Crazy Stupid Love, I think, is slightly different than Game Night in that um, there is also one sort of main protagonist, but it does very much feel like an ensemble movie. Uh, and each of those characters have, have separate goals. They're not all trying to achieve the same thing, but their goals are each sort of, um, you know, they, each of their goals fall into the same kind of umbrella of re a relationship goal, right? It's, they're all united by kind of the idea of love, of crazy, stupid love, um, the thematic stuff that that movie's dealing with. Um, and then also there's, there's the added cohesiveness of the characters, the, the way they're related to each other and the way they interact in each other's storylines, right? So there's a lot of overlap there with characters who have their own goal but are affecting another character's pursuit of their goal in the movie. 
Um, so hopefully uh, you can, some of this is useful for you. Uh, and I know you're asking specifically about how to, how to think about plotting those out. Like, are you going to have three separate catalyst moments or inciting incident moments, whichever term you like to use? Um, you know, are you going to have a different set of plot beats for each of those storylines? And I think, yes, you will. Um, if your characters are all pursuing their own individual goals, then you will have a separate plot beat um, for each of their, you know, their pursuits. Uh, so you'll have a, a, an inciting incident in, say, your first character pursuing her goal, then also for uh, subsequent or your additional characters. I told you I'm overcaffeinated today. Um, so you'll have you'll have those plot beats for each of the characters um, pursuing their goal. Uh, and one thing that might be helpful is to um, well, I don't. Hopefully, this will be helpful. But to think about it almost like an episode of TV, right? Because when you plot out an episode of TV, you're going to have those very distinct separate storylines that will still usually will still intertwine in some way. They'll still affect each other and, and cross, and you'll have sometimes a scene that is moving the plot forward for, for two separate or multiple storylines, right? Um, so it might help you to think about, maybe, it might help you to think about your movie in terms of, you know, beating out each individual storyline with its own plot beats, um, its own catalyst, break into two, you know, midpoint, I would do kind of the major plot beats for each of your storylines, and then try to weave them together and see what, uh, where you can, you know, use one event as a, as a turning point for, for multiple storylines, maybe that might help kind of intertwine them. Um, okay, so I think those were your questions. Let's see. Um, Oh, you also asked Maria, you also asked, um, you find it hard to, to plot out the structure of your stories because you're, um, you are drawn to character driven stories that aren't as plot heavy. Um, the characters usually have less physical goals and the antagonists are rarely physical. So how do you make the structure work? Um, yes, I, that is also a good question because not every story is going to be a, you know, big um, external plot driven story, that's okay. I think those, you know, those stories are, are, are easy to plot out if you think of the pursuit of the goal, um, if you kind of keep that in mind, right? Um, just because it's not an external plot, or uh, sorry, an external goal, doesn't mean that um, the plot isn't still revolving around a character pursuing something. So I think the key there, if you're, if your character isn't pursuing something like, you know, to pull off a bank heist or to win a championship, like something that is very external and um, uh, concrete like that, that if you can still indicate to us what it is that the character wants, even if it's just an emotional state that they're pursuing, um, you can still use that as, you know, the spine of the story that you're building with the plot beats all revolving around the pursuit of that goal, even though it's not an external thing or as external, right? So, you know, if you think about it, um, a lot of romances kind of fall into this category because the characters are pursuing a, say, a relationship with someone, which is, which is external. There's an external indication of that. We can see it happening, but it really is a, um, an emotional state that they're trying to get to, right? They're trying to be in love with this person. Um, so you might take your cue from that and figure out what it is that your character wants. What, what would success look like at the end of this movie? Um, kind of keep that in mind as the goal that your character is pursuing and then work on structuring your movie around the pursuit of that goal. So if it's, um, you know, if I don't have a good example for something that's, that's very internal, um, for some reason, the one that's coming to mind is Goodwill Hunting because I think in that movie, uh, he is he seems sort of like he's just reacting. He's gotten in trouble. He's uh, sentenced or whatever to having to go to therapy. Uh, so he's just kind of like doing the things that he's told to do. But we don't have a um, like a, a real. It doesn't seem like there's a real end point that he's trying to get to. He's just kind of go going through the motions of what he's been told to do. Um, but I think if you watch that movie, 
and sort of pay attention to the emotional stuff that they talk about and uh, the friendships that he has, what you kind of understand in the the subtext of it is that he really wants things, he's trying to keep things the same. He doesn't want to leave, even though he has an opportunity to go and do amazing things and, um, you know, he's super smart so he could change the world or whatever, but he really is trying to stay in his little bubble of safety. Um, so, you know, maybe look at that one as sort of a, a template or something that you could um, pull some inspiration from of how to have a goal that doesn't feel um, or that isn't as external and concrete, but that still feels like it's kind of, you know, giving the story momentum. I think that's really the ch the thing that you want to avoid is feeling like your character isn't pursuing anything at all. Like they, they don't want anything. So even like in Goodwill Hunting, uh, you know, we may not feel like it's a, it's a huge um, motivation or it's a huge uh, thing that he's trying to achieve to, to complete his therapy, but we still know there's something, you know, that's giving him, that's giving his life structure. Basically he, he's still going through the sort of, um, the actions of, of trying to fulfill that. There's a train horn. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Uh, okay. So I don't know if that made sense at all really, but, um, but I'm going to say if you are trying to plot out a story with, uh, with a more internal goal, that's something that's not external and concrete, as long as you can still let us know what it is that the character wants, what it is that's motivating them and driving them forward, that will give, um, that will give the story momentum versus, uh, having a character that doesn't seem like they're trying to do anything at all, I think that can, that's where a story can feel stagnant and it can feel like there isn't any momentum because we don't, it, it's not that there isn't, it's just that we don't know what it is the character's doing. And that's when, you know, when that happens, a lot of times if you're reading a script and that's the feeling you're getting, it's, it's hard to keep going because you, you just don't have anything to hook into. It's like, I don't know why I'm, reading the story because I don't know what the character is trying to do. Um, Anton asks, is an internal goal always stronger than an external goal? I know. I think um, if by stronger you mean uh, does it make for a better story? I think no. I think a story can be good and can be strong with either an external goal or an internal internal goal. Um, I think it's easier to plot for sure if you can, if you have something, it's easier to plot if you know what your character is trying to achieve, right? Because you know the direction that they're trying to go in and then you can throw obstacles in their way. Um, and I think often it's easier if there is an external component to it because then we know you know, physically what the character needs to be doing to try to achieve that thing. So, so I wouldn't say it's stronger to have an external goal. I just think sometimes it makes it easier for you as the writer to work with an external goal because it's concrete, you know, it's, um, it's easy to see there's physical stuff to do in pursuit of it. So, but I don't think it's, it makes for a stronger story necessarily. I think uh, what makes for a stronger story is if we know what the goal means to the character. It, that's what's, what gets us invested in going along on the journey, right? If you show us, whether it's an internal goal or an external goal, if you can help us understand why this is so important to the character, what it means to them, why they feel compelled to do it, uh, you know, what the reward will be or what the stakes are if they fail, that's, I think, um, what makes the story stronger. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, and thanks for being here. And uh, okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, so Joe asked, uh, after the inciting incident that changes the protagonist's world, they typically spend a little bit of time resisting the call to adventure. Uh, what should the protagonist be doing during this time? Um, and he says that he has a situation where his protagonist suddenly has to deal with something that's happened to her kid. It feels like she should just go and tackle it head on, but um, that's not typic That's not what typical structure calls for. So, what should she do in the meantime? And this is a good question too that I have um, that I have been asked. Uh, okay, so so in that section, well, let's back up. Let's talk about so what the character is going to do in Act Two, generally is a very risky thing, right? It's either physically dangerous or 
at least emotionally risky, right? So we understand there's some peril involved. It's a, it's a, that's what makes it an interesting thing for them to try to attempt. So um, again, going back to the meaning, even if it's not a physically dangerous thing, we understand what pursuing this act two thing means to them. And so that can make it emotionally risky, right? Um, you know, that's, that's, those are just going to be more interesting stories if a character is like sort of, you know, risking a lot, putting it all on the line to pursue something that's very meaningful to them. Um, so, so that's your break into two is when they begin to pursue that risky thing, right? The catalyst or inciting incident that you're talking about, that's usually it introduces some sort of uh, problem or opportunity to your, to your character. And then the thing that they're pursuing in act two is their response to that or attempt at a solution to that, right? General, generally, this is what we're talking about. So the space between that inciting incident and that break into two, what should they be doing when they, they have this problem and then there's this risky thing that they're going to attempt in order to solve that problem, right? What should they be doing in there? If they, if they know they have a problem, why don't they just get right to it and start solving it, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of stuff that can happen in there, but basically you're just trying to make it believable that they would do this risky thing um, because and that's, you know, that's a very general description of it, but you're trying to basically get the audience on board um, with them attempting this crazy plan or dangerous plan or whatever it is that they're going to be doing. Um, so a lot of times what you'll do in, well, so, okay, so the obvious things that you might do in that section are eliminate the easy solutions. Um, because if your character is about to do something really risky, we have to understand, like just plot logic wise, we have to understand why they're not doing the obvious solutions that we all might think of, right? So closing a lot of those doors can happen. I think that's the, that's the obvious thing that you might do first. Um, but going back to the meaning again, I think if you can show us what it means to the character to solve this problem, why they're compelled to solve it, um, how important it is to them, what kind of effect the problem is having on their life. So showing us the magnitude of the problem, um, that gets us on board with the character. Like if we understand why this is such a big problem to them, how it's a problem in their life, and then we understand um, the meaning about, uh, you know, what it would mean to them if they could solve this problem, that's good emotional stuff to sort of get us on board with them then doing the risky thing. Because uh, I think you lose your audience if you send them on a risky journey that seems unnecessary or we don't understand, you know, why someone would do that. It's, it, it, it doesn't keep us sort of engaged with it if we're like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't get why this character is, is doing this crazy thing that seems dumb you're going to lose your audience, right? So, um, so I think convincing us, basically, uh, and showing us why your character has to solve this problem, why they have to solve it the way that they're about to solve it by doing the thing that they're, they're trying to do in Act 2, um, those are the things that you want to do in the debate section, right? As um, convince us. You're, you're, it's less a, I think it, it doesn't always have to be a debate that the character is having of should I or shouldn't I. It's really... Um, sort of the mental debate that you're giving your audience of, of convincing us that they should do this thing and it's the only option or it's the best option and here's why and here's what it means to the character and, um, you know, getting us invested in the character of, who's about to do this really risky thing. So hopefully that makes sense for you, Joe. Um, uh, good point about eliminating easy solutions. Thanks. Um, thank you. And uh, let's see. Can you help me with a recommendation for a very linear history with few characters? How can I turn this into an attractive option? I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, can you help me with a recommendation for a very linear history? So I think you have a story that's based on real events that are, that are very linear, um, and you're trying to... I'm not sure if you're referring just to the debate section or to the movie as a whole, but um, maybe you can maybe you can give me a little bit more to go on. I think um, if it's if you're dealing with events that feel very linear, and you're trying to make them feel more exciting or less 
expected. Um, you know, just because you know they're linear doesn't mean that your characters know what's going to happen next, right? So I think if you can play with that tension of their expectation of how things are going to go and then hopefully using the real events that you're trying to stick to, um, to subvert their expectations or to throw something, you know, unexpected or scary or, or dramatic in their way, um, you know, thinking about it in terms of what your characters think is going to happen and then what really happens in the movie might help, might help if you're, if you're plotting a very linear story, but I'm not exactly sure if that's what you're asking. So if you want to give a few more details, I can try to answer that a little bit better. Um, in the meantime, um, okay. So Anton asked uh, a question about subplots. Maybe subplot isn't the right word, right word for it. Um, let's see. So he says, we have an A story, the action, the plot, and we often have a B story, the emotional level, the inner growth of the protagonist. Sometimes we have C and D stories of other characters that come into play and are in interacting with the main A story. Uh, sometimes a bit confusing when it comes to structure, where to put them and connecting them with the main story. Where should I start them and end them? Um, what would you describe as a subplot and an A, B, or C story? And how much intersection or different subplots um, should a main story have? Okay, so yeah, you're right. That is a, that's a pretty big topic. Um, my thoughts are this. Uh, any, any character who's pursuing a goal, that, that line of action is a plot line, right? So it could be your A story. It could be your main, the thing that your movie is about. That's your A story. Um, that main character pursuing that goal around which this entire movie is built. That's your A story. Um, but any other goal that they're pursuing, that's, uh, you know, I, I think there's, it's probably a little subjective, but it could be related to the A story. It could be unrelated. Any other goal that that character or any other character is pursuing, I think is really a, um, could be considered a subplot. Um, so th that's my thought on that. <laughs> you can feel free to disagree. I think that's the cleanest way to look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of good examples for you. For some reason, the example that comes to mind is the movie Hitch. So Will Smith has his, his A story thing that he's trying to do, right? And then the guy, I think it's, is it Kevin James? The guy that he is helping, um, that he is helping to get his dream girl or whatever, like that, Kevin James's pursuit of that dream girl is a subplot, right? So Will Smith interacts with that subplot and he helps Kevin James, but the subplot is Kevin James's pursuit of a relationship with, um, I can't remember the actress, but with his dream girl. So that is uh, the first example that comes to mind for, for whatever reason. Oh, if we look at game night, since we've been talking about that a little bit, um, each of those supporting characters who have a relationship issue that they're working out. So they are each trying to, you know, if you could think about it in terms of the goal for each of those supporting characters is to work out the relationship issue that they're dealing with. So each of those is a subplot because they have a goal that they're pursuing and we could track the line of action in just that pursuit of that goal separate from the main plot. It may intersect and it may affect the main plot, but it has its own arc, right? Uh, okay, so hopefully that answers your question. And then how much intersection should different subplots or stories have with the main story? I think that is totally dependent on your individual story. I think it's going to be on a case by case basis that, you know, um, I think the thing that you're always trying to achieve is a feeling that it all goes together, that there's like a cohesiveness and a deliberateness to the way you have constructed this story. Um, so uh, it's going to be case by case. If your story only needs a subplot to intersect with it once and we understand why you're telling us the main story and the subplot story, that could work. Um, so I don't, I don't have a, I don't have like a hard and fast rule for how much it, it should intersect. It really just depends on the story. Um, and that might be one of those things that you have to test out with your friends and your beta readers. You know, if you, if you have, a subplot that they comment feels like it doesn't belong in the in the script or feels like they don't understand, you know, it's taking away from the A story, it's pulling us out of that action and distracting us and we don't understand what it has to do with the A story or why you're telling us both of these stories at the same time. 
then you know you sort of take that note and and try to figure out if you need to integrate it more or cut it all together. Um, but that may be something that you just test on on people. Uh, you know, go with your gut how much you think it needs to be in there, and then sort of gauge by the reactions that you get. That's probably not very helpful because I know it means doing a lot of work up front before you figure out if it's working. Um, but sometimes that's the only way to know, right? Okay. Um, so then Christina had a question uh, about sequences and springboards, um, which is something that we've been talking about in that five-part blog post series. Um, in particular, is a sequence a scene or a string of scenes? Uh, I guess the springboard would have to be one scene since it's an important event, question mark. Um, yes. So to elaborate on that, I'll try to explain this a little bit better. Um, Yes, a sequence is a string of scenes. Um, I know you're sort of asking uh, uh, how long is a sequence and of what degree of significance should it be? That's your question here. When plotting the outline, which details of the plot do you sift out to decide this is one detail that's sequence worthy? Um, so again, a little bit subjective probably, and you're just going to think about it in terms of your individual story that you're plotting out. but. Um, in general, I would say, you know, try not to think about sequences as needing to be a specific thing. Really, it's just a big movement of it's, it, you know, it's a big movement in the plot. So you have, you know, we're, we're sort of starting with the eight sequences as the template and then figuring out if that works for your story or not. Um, but, uh, you know, I I think a good place to start is thinking about a sequence as being sort of a, a, the pursuit of a, of a smaller portion of the big goal, right? So, um, you know, if we're looking at game night again, as, as that example, because it's fresh in my mind, um, the, the goal that the main character is pursuing is, um, what is the goal? Uh, to win at game night, I guess. Um, that's the, I think, is that the break into two? Let me just look at, I have my, my beats here. Um, yeah, so the break into two is, um, Max goes, you know, he decides that he's going to, he's going to beat his brother Brooks at game night. He needs to win in order to solve his problem of insecurity that he's having, which is preventing him from, um, making a baby with his wife. Okay. So he sets out in act two to win game night and that, uh, the, the difficulty of that goal escalates as it becomes a real kidnapping. Uh, a really dangerous situation, um, physically dangerous and all that. And, you know, he is learning and growing. And so we, we see the meaning of that goal sort of escalating for him as well as it becomes about saving his brother. Um, okay. So a smaller portion of that goal, right, would be um, – the, the first sort of smaller portion of that goal would be uh, to show up at game night and play the game that you want to play, maybe. I can't remember if that's exactly, you know, how you would articulate it. But um, so if the bigger goal is to win game night, then, then the first smaller goal is to show up at game night and try to get everyone to play the game that you know you're good at. Um, so that might be one sequence, right? And then at the end of that sequence, there will be what I call a springboard. Um, but you could just think of as a, you know, a, a plot point or a turning point, um, a bigger turning point in your story where, so that springboard might be, um, you know, the, the game that you want to play isn't an option because Brooks has arranged to play this, um, this like murder mystery type of game, this, you know, interactive treasure, not treasure hunt, um, scavenger hunt type of, type of game or whatever, right? Where you have to find the kidnapped guy. So, so that is going to turn the story in a different direction, give the main character a new mini goal that is still under the umbrella of the big goal of winning game night. So um, the initial goal was to, uh, the initial mini goal was to, um, to convince everyone to play Pictionary so that you can win game night, right? And then the springboard would be uh, the, this kidnapping game is what we're gonna play instead. So then the next, that would launch us into the next mini goal, which is, okay, figure out how to win the kidnapping game. Um, and then that might end in the springboard that is, 
we discover it's not a game, it's a, it's a real kidnapping. And so then that gives the character a new mini goal of, um, you know, save, get, save Brooks from the kidnappers and get him to safety, right? And then that might end in a springboard of uh, the kidnappers come back and take Brooks again. I can't really remember exactly how the plot plays out, but I think, I think the example hopefully is helpful where um, each sequence is a series of scenes that is sort of, uh, you can think about it in terms of a pursuit of a, a smaller portion of the big goal. Um, you can also sometimes think about it is, as a, um, you know, a series of scenes that are, that are sort of organized around one type of action that changes after there's a springboard. So it might be, um, you know, in this sequence, this is where they're running from the bad guys. And then there's, say, a springboard that sends the story in a new direction. And then the next sequence might be, this is where they're chasing the bad guys, right? Or this is where they're hiding from the bad guys. Or, um you know, the what if the springboard is you find out the person you're working with is actually a bad guy. So then the next sequence is uh, fighting, fighting that bad guy or whatever, right? So um, hopefully that's helpful. I'm just trying to impart to you that it's, uh, you know, uh, there isn't a, there isn't like a set of parameters that you have to meet necessarily with each sequence. It's really just a way for you to think about organizing the action of your story, um, either around, you know, smaller milestones to achieving the bigger goal or around type of action that they're taking in different sections of the story. Um, to, it, and it kind of helps you when you're plotting out your story, uh, it kind of helps you think about you know, escalating the action. Also making sure that you don't have um, a really repetitive story. Like if they're just doing the same thing in every single sequence, that's going to feel pretty repetitive to us unless there's like a huge es escalation of stakes or something that really is just making doing the same thing much harder each in each sequence. But even then, I think you're going to have to change it up at some point. Um, so that's, that's really what what's useful, I guess, about thinking in terms of springboards and sequences is just making sure that you are constantly moving your story forward, uh, you know, changing it up in the type of action or the, or the, you know, the thing that they're pursuing so that it feels like there's variety, it feels like things are building, and that you're using those springboards to sort of like turn the story so it doesn't feel, um, you know, linear, or episodic or whatever. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, so that was uh, Christina's question. I think I answered it. Um, hopefully I did. Uh, and that's all I have for you guys. So um, I think we are done unless, let me check and see. No, I think, I think in the comments you guys are, are good. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Um, sorry, I needed to scroll. Uh, let's see, Anton, you're welcome for the debate section um, stuff. And Joe, I agree re regarding the debate. I never thought about the debate section being a debate with the audience or justifying the protagonist's choice to the audience. That's a good way to look at it. Cool. Glad that's helpful. Um, and Jeffrey says, any tips for creating a screenplay from a novel? Oh, that is a good question. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know if these are tips. This is this is what I have done in the past. So just looking at, you know, the, the, the novel, everything that you have in the novel, um, figuring out what that main goal is that the character is going to pursue, um, because that is really the thing that you're building the spine of your movie around, right? And this is why a lot of times uh, adapting novels to, to movies is difficult, because novels have so much more freedom to have lots of characters doing lots of different things and spanning a lot of time and getting very internal. Those are often things that make it difficult to adapt. Um, but I think if you can sort of take the source material and just try to find the core story, uh, a lot of times you're going to just have to cut a lot of stuff. And But find that core story, figure out, you know, start with, the, this is what I would do, start with the essentials. Who's the main character? What's the thing that they're that they're doing in Act Two? So what's that goal that they're pursuing? Um, and who's the antagonist, or what's the main source of opposition to that goal? And then just build the story up from there using what you can from the source material, right? So um, 
sometimes you have to like tweak events that happen in the novel to be a little bit more uh, cinematic or external or just easier for a screenplay. Um, so sometimes it's about like finding the spirit of the story and then figuring out the movie version of, you know, that's faithful to that spirit. Um, but, but sometimes you have to change the events. Uh, but yes, that is what I would do. I would, I would find the essentials because that's the, that's the, you know, that's the spine. That's the core of your story, figure out who wants what, uh, what's standing in their way and then work on, um, pulling out from the source material, the, the stuff that you can use to plot around that. So then, um, so if you, if you know that, if you know what the break into two is like, this is where the character decides to pursue, you know, or starts pursuing this, this goal, then what's the catalyst or what's the inciting incident? What's the event that gives them the problem that this act two thing is a solution to, right? That's kind of how I would, I would look at it. And then looking at the, you know, the character pursuing that goal, what can you pull from the, from the novel to sort of build out those sequences that they're, that they're um, using to move towards that goal? And what are the springboards that send them in a new direction, give them a setback, uh, change, you know, change the goal or change the quality of action that they have to take. Um, that's what I would do. I think we talked about this in another um, interview video. I, and I can't remember, Unfortunately, I can't remember who I was speaking with that that we said this, but um, I have heard um, other writers say that adapting is all about uh, contracting and expanding in the right places. So it's like, you know, sometimes it's finding the the one sort of, you know, line of action that you want to build the entire movie around and you sort of have to expand it to to fit that length. Um, at, but then a lot of times it's like contracting other, you know, stretches of time or, or um, amounts of action to fit into kind of the, the traditional movie arc that we, that we typically try to structure a story around. I don't know if that's helpful to you, but I have found that helpful. Um, okay. So, oh, hey, Anya. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Glad you guys have been here. I know this is a uh, this is a, kind of a weird way to do a Q and A because I'm the only one talking, and I would love to be able to have a little bit more back and forth with you guys. Um, and uh, but feel free to put more questions in the comments. I will I will try to answer them. Um, I think I'm I think I'm much more succinct in writing. <laughs> Although if you've read my blog post, you may find that untrue. Um, but yes, I will try to answer more questions for you. Uh, Oh, you're welcome, Jeffrey. Uh, Joe says, I like what you said about escalating the action early. Do you have any tips on figuring out what to let the audience know first and what to withhold until later? In terms of what, Joe? Um, in terms of what to, I mean, so generally, I think that you should, I guess the general rule is just let people know only what they need to know in order to understand where you're, you know, what's happening in the story. Um, give them the essential context and, and let that be enough. Uh, and this is another thing that you'll probably gauge with, uh, oh, with reveals. That's what you're asking. Hmm. Do you have any tips on figuring out what to let the audience know first in terms of reveals? Um, I mean, I think the rule of thumb might just be, figure out what's more shocking or, or meaningful and then sort of reveal things in that order because you, you always want things to escalate. But without, without specifics, I, I hesitate to give you, you know, any, any hard and fast rules. I, I wouldn't give you hard and fast rules anyway. I think that it just depends on your story. Um, but yes, I would, I would try to think of things probably in terms of escalating, like what's going to be more, surprising or what's going to clue the audience in on a new meaning or how much more meaningful this thing is now that they know this information. Um, I hope that's helpful. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up because I've been here for almost an hour and uh, I, I've been rambling long enough and taking up your, your day. Um, again, post questions if you, if you have them and everybody can chime in. We can all answer each, other, uh, each other's questions if you like. Uh, I know Anton chimed in for Joe, I think, um, which was very helpful. So thank you for doing that. Um, if you want 
specific movie examples for anything that I've said, just ask and I will try to come up with some better examples um, that aren't game night if that's not helpful for you. And, uh, and oh, if you want to, uh, you know, work on outlining your story, we have a class that's starting, um, I think it's next Saturday, the 25th, uh, that you can sign up for and we're all gonna, you know, break the story together and you'll have weekly, um, You'll have weekly check-ins that you can get your specific story questions answered on the project that you're working on. So it's not just you're learning something and then having to apply it yourself. You're actually going to get to workshop it with myself and with the other people in the class. So I hope you will join us for that. Uh, okay, and that's it. Um, again, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you guys showing up and asking questions. It's fun for me, and I hope you have gotten the answers that you needed. And I will talk to you soon. Okay, bye.